So as you can see from the rafters and back, I'm outside in my shop right now. I've got a 16 by 20 shed, which is about as big a shop as I thought I could get away with in my backyard. This thing doesn't get a tremendous amount of use because I use hand drills for most things, but it's really a neat piece of machinery because as you turn it, it's got a cam up here and a lever that advances the drill down automatically. Um, so it drills right in. As you can see, it cuts some pretty nice holes. Uh, originally made for metal work. Um, a lot of woodworkers also used them. So I got lucky and a friend found this one for like 200 bucks, which that's about what you pay for drill press anyway. So why not? Um, draw knives, um, bracing bits over here, use the brace part. My son's cluttered workbench, I made him that when he was six, he used it and makes a beautiful mess out of it most of the time, which is about what it's for. Mm -hmm. um, my workbench, it's based on a Rubeau design from the, the 1880s or so. Um, this one's just made out of, of uh, four by six pine. It works really well. As you can see, it's beaten, it's battered, it's got chips and chunks and paint and all sorts of things. Um, I built my own bench vise. I got a tap and die for the screw. It works surprisingly well. Um, as you can see up on the wall, I've got bench planes over here. I've got molding planes up there. Hand saws here and here. All my chisels, a few gouges, all my miscellaneous stuff stuck up in the window. Some of the specialty planes up there. Got bunches and bunches of clamps. Got my medieval toolboxes. We've got a box that we're going to be doing some work on today. Um, my uh, my power tool, that's pretty much the one I've got. I mean, technically I've got a couple more, but this is the only one that really sees any use anymore. Um, one of these days I'll get around, I've said this for years, but one of these days I'll get around and make a foot for one. But for the moment, the lathe is still powered. Um, that is my now semi-organized wood pile. This is my sharpening and miscellaneous junk bench. As you can see, the bottom is just crammed full of all sorts of, of stuff. This is the one part of the shop that I have not touched in quite a while and really need to clean up and get rid of a lot of stuff. Um, the sharpening bench over here, oh, this, if anybody's wondering, is for paint making. So it's got a muller, a granite top, a, a couple of mortise and pestles. It's also what the stones down here are for. Blue, green, makes neat paint. Um, this is my sharpening bench. This actually gets a fair amount of use. It's fairly simple, um, but it's one of the skills that you have to have to be good at hand tool woodworking. So sharpening, if you're interested in hand tool woodworking, sharpening is a fundamental skill. Um, most tools you buy these days, with the exception of the nice high-end ones, don't start out sharp. Uh, they come factory sharpened, which is factory dull. Um, so I have a belt sanding belt here which is my coarse grind. I use uh, oil stones primarily. Um, I have used Japanese water stones. They work brilliantly. They're just a little messy for my taste so I went back to some older more European style stuff and I like it better. Realistically you can use almost any sharpening system you care for whether it's water stones, diamond plate, sandpaper, kind of a mix of stuff. Whatever you use just make sure that you are comfortable using it and get good at what you have. Um, but again, so I use sandpaper, coarse, like 80 grit sandpaper or 120, whatever you happen to get a hold of for my coarse grinding. And then I move along to coarse oil stones and then a fine natural Arkansas stone and then a synthetic um, um, razor strop uh, for doing straight razor shaving from, this one's probably from the early 1900s. Um, I've got a diamond plate here. I really don't use it much for anything. I just don't have a better home for it, so it sits there. Um, for all my gouges and things, I've got a number of different slips, Arkansas stones, a homemade one that somebody made that I found in an antique store that works really well. Um, just uh, a commercial manufactured one back here. Um, Again, it doesn't really matter particularly what medium you use as long as you get comfortable using it and can put an edge on that will shave. If you can't shave with it, the tool's really not sharp enough. Um, so this is kind of your foundation of things. And this is where all really good woodworking starts from. <clears throat> and I'm gonna pan up a little bit. And as you can see up here, these are all the planes for the most part that I haven't gotten around to really fixing up yet. Um, these three have tuned up and they're sharp, but they don't have a home really. They're just kind of extras. All the wooden bodied ones I really want to play around more with and just haven't. 
um, a bunch of axes and other things, log saws up there, uh, augers for doing green woodwork, which I live in Arizona, so not a whole lot of chance to do that, unfortunately. Um, I have a paint cabinet over here that's the old kitchen cabinet. I have an old ice box here from the 1930s that I really want to restore in my copious amounts of free time. Tools and the handles on. And it just builds in. So, oh, and some old chairs up there that I want to copy. Um, a lot of my, a lot of my stuff comes from antique stores, if you couldn't guess. Um, so I'm going to pan over to the hand planes right now. I have a lot of hand planes. If you're getting into woodworking, you don't need this many hand planes. Um, realistically, you need three or four. Um, for those who know, who don't know anything about hand planes, so most of mine are old Stanleys. Um, you've got a two, a three, two fours, a five and a quarter, a five. I uh, forget, I think it's a 42 or 40 scrub plane, a six, a seven, and eight. Um, the numbers they have, uh, they've kept for modern hand planes. So if you go in and you buy like a Lee Nielsen, which is a brand new, really high end maker, they make fantastic tools, by the way. If you buy a number three, it'll be almost the same as a Stanley number three, only better quality. Uh, but what you really need if you're starting things out, a number four, a number five, and either a number six or a number seven. Uh, the number seven is a little bit better for joining. The number six is a little easier to handle. All the rest of them are extras. They're nice to haves. Um, you shouldn't pay more than 25 bucks for a number four, maybe 35 for a number five. The number six or number seven will be a little more expensive, 65, 75 bucks. Um, look around, you can find them in antique stores, tune them up, fix them. Um, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about hand planes in a minute um, when we do a little bit of breakdown in actual woodworking. Um, we're gonna scroll over to the saws. So this is a big mix of saws. Realistically, I use these three and those two. The rest of them I either need to tune up or get rid of one of these days. Um, this is the only brand new handsaw I own. And it is a fantastic little rip saw from Gramercy Tools. Um, it costs more than all the rest of my saws in here put together. And that's not an exaggeration. On the other hand, it also taught me what a really, really good saw is. So it helped me learn to sharpen up some of my other saws, which is one of the few weak spots in sharpening I have still, is my, my saw sharpening is not as good as I would like it. And a really sharp saw, like any sharp tool, makes your life a lot easier. So I've got two rip saws. This is one of my favorites. Um, this one's probably from the 1860s, 1870s. And it cuts like a champ. I love this thing to death. I paid less than 20 bucks for it at an antique store. Um, this is by the same manufacturer. It's a little bit newer. This one's 1930s. This is a crosscut saw, which we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between rip and crosscut if you don't know. Um, I also really like it. And these are my two a rip and a crosscut large tenon saws. And they work pretty well. Um, chisels of all sorts. Rasps, these are about my favorite thing ever. These are rasps from a company called Arroyo. Uh, it's French, I think that's how it's pronounced. I don't really speak French, so good chance I'm butchering that. Um, these are what they call a hand-stitched rasp. The pattern is irregular, it's very sharp. They do a number on anything you put them to, and I love these things to death. They're expensive and they're worth every penny. Uh, these are my, uh, my breakdown saws, technically. That one goes over here. So I have two nice crosscut saws. I have two or I have three rip saws that I use a fair amount. Um, and the rest of these are just kind of extras that I, I had a saw buying problem. <laughs> um, and I bought a fair number of them. Some of them I will get around to restoring eventually, like this nice um, uh, miter saw. And I keep the braces that I use all the time here. Um, lastly, even if you do power tool woodworking, even every power tool guy should own at least one little plane like this. This These make um, chamfering edges and doing other small work incredibly easy. They're easy to set up, they're easy to sharpen, and they stay sharp for a really long time because really you don't put a lot of heavy use on them. Um, here are my hand drills. They take regular drill bits. They take, uh, what do I want to say, uh, countersink bits just fine. These things 
are very efficient and work a lot faster than people realize. I drilled completely through a couple of projects when I, uh, when I first got them because I didn't realize how well they worked. So we're going to work a little bit today, or I'm going to work a little bit today, on a six-board Viking-style chest. Um, basically, I'm going to show you how to break the board down if you don't already know. I'm going to show you how to plane it, cut the angle on it, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time carving because I've got a nice carving project going. I've already got this size pretty well carved. So you can see kind of what we're shooting for here. It's got a reasonable amount of depth to it. There's no stain on it or anything or paint because I'm going to actually paint this one with uh, period paints. Um, but once you get some paint and or stain on it, all the depth will really pop a lot more. But all that starts on this side here. Um, these are both based off a, a couple of rune stones, so the designs are fairly accurate, although much, much smaller than the actual stones, um, um, based out of stones found in Sweden. So uh, I like going back to some of the originals to put the artwork on because quite honestly, I'm not this kind of artistic. Drawing is not something that comes naturally to me, so it's a lot easier for me to take things that already exist and then transpose them on and then carve them. The little green benches here are what serve as my saw bench. These are not ideal, but I've used them for like nine years now, so I've kind of gotten used to them. All right, I'm gonna go grab a board. So one by 12 pine board I've got here, picked up Home Depot, Ace, wherever. When I'm looking at boards, if you look down this one, you can see there's not a lot of knots. Actually, in this one, there's none. So it's nice and clean. It's got a little bit of twist to it because you can see it bump up and down when I pop one edge. So we're gonna end up planing a lot of that out. But when I'm making a box, I'm pretty much gonna copy one of those. Um, these are out of one by tens. This one's gonna be a little bit deeper because I'm making it out of a one by 12 for the sides. It'll still have one by tens for the ends, the legs on this side. Um, that way it's the same width and fits. It'll just be a little bit taller. Give me a little bit more depth to put saws and other things in. So when I'm buying boards, I'm trying to find one with no knots. It's nice and clean, that way it's easy to cut, easy to plane. I want to look down the length of it. So for you guys, it would be looking down this length, and making sure that it's not super twisted or super cupped. Um, you can see this one has a little bit of a cup to it, at least I think you guys can see. It has a little bit of a bow this way, but it's not terrible, and that's easy enough to take out. If it's really rounded, either save that one for the lid or just ignore it. Um, and move on to a better board. Likewise, if it's got a lot of big knots running across it like this, those form hinge points where it can flex and move after you've cut it and put it into a box, which then really wrecks your box. So look for something with nice clean grain that's not super wonky. So a lot of people have a problem with the lumber here in Arizona because it's wet, it twists, it warps. The problem isn't really the lumber. The problem is that we live in Arizona. When you kiln dry lumber as a business, you put it into a kiln, you heat it up, and it drives out the moisture and drives down the moisture to about 14%, which for almost any place in the United States is more than adequate. Here in Arizona, our ambient humidity level is somewhere between six and 8%, which means all the lumber coming in here for our climate is really wet, and there's very little that they can do about that. Uh, their kilns really can't drive out that much more moisture. So when you get it, you want to let your lumber acclimate to your shop. Leave it there for a couple of months if you can. If it's thicker, you may want to leave it there for six months or even a year if you're dealing with really thick timbers. If you don't, then it will continue to shrink as it loses moisture to meet Arizona's humidity. Um, and you'll end up with splits and cracks and other things like I did on my bench top here. I've actually had to rebuild my bench top. Uh, twice because I was impatient when I built it in 2011. I went out and I bought the green timber and I pretty much slapped it together after a week out drying out, which it's four by sixes. That needs at least a year to really acclimate. Uh, that being said, the repairs weren't that tragic. It wasn't that hard. And I got to use the bench for almost a year before I had to fix it. So complaints are pretty minimal there. Um, if you're building fine furniture it's a, or semi-fine furniture, it's a different story or things that are going to go in your house. Uh, so anyway, back to the box. So we're going to cut a three foot length out of this, which is how long those boxes are because I made them out of one by threes that I found for a really good price 
at an Ace Hardware. Basically, I've just got a three foot rule and a pencil. I prefer traditional pencils, I sharpen them. Um, some people like mechanicals. It is all based on what you actually prefer. There's very little that is super right or super wrong. It's mostly about the tools you enjoy using. So this, if anybody doesn't know, is a square. This is a traditional English one, again, probably from the early 1900s. I'm always gonna line it up on a single edge of my board. I'm not gonna flop back and forth unless I'm checking the line. So everything I mark now, I will mark from this edge, which I should probably put a little mark on. Just a little, a little pencil line of some sort <clears throat> tells you what your reference face is. I'm gonna measure from this side. I'm gonna do my square from this side. I'm gonna flip this around. <clears throat> so I've got a pencil line all the way across. That's my three foot section. There's my little reference mark to tell me which side I'm referencing everything from. And as you can see, I mean, it's got all the, all the marks from the store. There's nothing special about this board. Um, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna take one of my crosscut saws, I'm gonna cut just on the outside of this line, and then we're gonna take everything from there. Now, if you're making fine furniture and you're in the end stages, you're gonna to wanna to notch and or cut this line so that it cuts clean. Given that we're gonna plane all this stuff up, including the end grain later, I'm not gonna worry about any of this now. The chest that I'm making today is fairly rough work as far as these things go, so there's not a lot of super fine details until you get to the carving portion. Um, but if you're making, I don't know, a, a bookshelf or a end table or something nice to go inside, you're gonna wanna take a little bit more time. <clears throat> if you're making SCA stuff that's gonna get kicked around like my toolboxes, even though they look fancy, don't sweat it. It's gonna take a certain amount of abuse anyway. Close really is good enough in most of these cases. So I'm gonna grab a saw. So see how they're all at a single angle? I'm gonna tip it up on its edge and see how there is no blade to them really. It's all out at the end. They're like little chisel points. This is a rip saw. It's made for digging into the end grain and basically levering out pieces. So you're cutting lengthwise down a board, not across the grain. Um, so the rip saw is gonna cut this way down a board. And it's gonna take the grain and it's gonna pluck little pieces out of it as we go. Um, this one is just about my favorite rip saw ever. I love the thumb hole. They keep it relatively sharp. Um, this one is super thin and tapered, not because it was built that way, but because somebody has sharpened about half this saw way over its life. So this was also somebody else's favorite saw for a really long time. This is a crosscut saw. The teeth on it are a little smaller. It's a little hard to see, but they look like little shark teeth, more like little diamonds, and they have a little edge on them. That's for cutting across the grain. So it slices the fiber of the grain. So back to the board, instead of cutting down the grain and levering pieces out, it literally cuts across the grain and it severs all these fibers like little knife teeth. So there are two different types of saws. They are used for distinctly different things. Um, and if you try and use them for the wrong thing, you can make them work, but it's really cumbersome. They don't work well. We're gonna use the crosscut saw, which has the little sharp teeth. Now, if you go to the, the store like Home Depot or whatever, this is the kind of saw you're gonna find. And honestly, the ones they make today are just fine. They, they, they're good crosscut saws. The only problem with them is the handle. Um, I'm gonna switch off to a 1930s saw for a minute. So, take a look at this handle here. My fist does not fit in there. It is not because the folks in the 1930s had small hands. It is because your whole hand doesn't go in there. Three fingers go in and your finger goes out like a pistol grip like this. The reason for that is if I take, this the handle I made, I made it a little big, but if I take this and I grip it hard, what happens is it'll kick off to the side like that. It won't be straight. When you extend the finger and pistol grip, it aligns the saw with the arm and allows you to cut a straight line. So if you go and buy a Home Depot saw, it's gonna have this big honking handle on it because most people are just using them to chop through two lines. And nobody really cares how straight the line is. When you're actually learning to saw, it's always finger out, pistol grip. 
that again aligns the saw with the arm which allows you to cut a straight line rather than kinking it to the side which makes sawing really difficult so it's just one of those things that i had to learn sawing is one of those things that you look at and you think this should be super easy and it's so not easy to cut a straight line it takes some practice so when you first start draw your line cut just outside of it to give yourself a little bit of playroom because your top and your bottom are not likely to be the same. And when I first started, I would have marked this line on all four sides and flipped the board over a couple of times back and forth. I still do that when cutting big long rips because the blade does tend to wander a little bit. Um, I've gotten good enough at cross cutting that it's not quite as necessary, but something you guys may still want to consider. So I'm gonna put a knee on the board. I'm gonna pinch right where my line is. I'm gonna put the saw on my finger like this. I'm going to pull gently and then push. And I'm not going to put a lot of force behind the saw when I push, a little bit, but not a lot. I'm not trying to force it through the wood. If the teeth are sharp, it'll do its own job. And the weight of the saw will draw it down into the cut. My fingers are going to stay here because if I leave them out to the side, it allows the saw to jump around a little bit. If I leave them right on the edge of the blade, it holds the blade steady. Um, I found this out, and it's a really important thing to learn when I was rip sawing and I drove one of the points of that rip saw right through my thumbnail. Um, because I had my thumb over here and as I was cutting it popped out to the side and I drove it right in. That being said, unlike a table saw, you come with a built-in saw stop. As soon as that first tooth hit, I stopped. So I'm just gonna cut this off now. There you go. Not that long, not that hard. Everything pretty smoothly. That's the basics of sawing. Most of sawing, like most of hand tool woodworking, is about practice and repetition. If you want to get good at hand skills of any sort, you need to practice them and repeat them. The more of it you do, the better it will get. Now this is a square. A uh, Viking box typically has canted sides. So we're going to switch off to a sliding bevel gauge. This one's already been set for the dimensions on this box. So basically I just pop the lid open, check the angle on that, because I like the angle on these boxes. And that's what we're going to go with. The angles on boxes are pretty personal. You have to find the one that you like the looks of the best. If you look at the different boxes that they've actually found in period, they are not identical in the slightest. Um, some of them are pretty shallow angles, some of them are much steeper angles. It's about figuring out what you like the looks of the best and then just replicating the box you like the looks of. If you cut one at a super steep angle and you put it together and you like it, use that as your reference point. Um, unlike, unlike modern power tool woodworking, most old school hand woodwork doesn't rely on precise measurements in the way we think about it. They don't tell you it's 13.5 inches long. They tell you, you know, measure this and then make everything else the same dimension or it's three times this dimension. Um, you see that a lot in 18th century woodwork and going back even further in some of the, the few manuals that we have to date back from. Um, when you look at old medieval woodworking manuscript pages, you know, where you see the guys laying things out, they're doing things in proportions. They're doing, you know, this, this dimension is two thirds of this dimension. Um, and it's the same here. It's not it has to be 15 degrees, it's what dimension looks pleasing to you? What angle do you like the looks of? So for example, I like the angle on those boxes. It's not super steep, it's not super shallow, they fit together nice, it just looks pleasing to my eye. Conversely, I tried a shallower angle on this, so it's got a much steeper side. I really don't like it as well. It's all right, I'm gonna finish the box, I won't copy that angle. On the other hand, other people may like an angle that's, that's shallow like that, where it doesn't angle as much. 
it's not wrong. It's just what you personally find interesting or pleasing. So back to the sliding bevel itself. You can still buy these at Ace Hardware or Home Depot or wherever. Some of them are really crappy. The thing that really matters on these is how you, I'm gonna hold it up, sorry, is how you actually tighten them down. This is not an ideal tightening mechanism. It works, this is my biggest sliding bevel, so I use it a lot. I'm gonna slide over. This is an old Stanley sliding bevel. It's all metal, you can see what I paid for it, 11 bucks. It has a thumb screw up here that tightens it. These things are amazing. If you ever find one of, like this, whether it's new or old or whatever, and you're interested in woodworking, pick this guy up. Uh, this by far, of them being a little small for a larger project, has the best tightening mechanism I've played with. Um, and if you have a fair amount of money to spare and like buying fancy tools, there are guys out there today making um, tools like that that are exquisite, um, but they're very expensive along with most new tools. Um, that being said, they'll outlast you, they'll outlast your kids and probably your grandkids. Um, as you can guess from a chunk of the tools I've showed you, I like old tools. And most of these are older than anybody alive today. Anyway, how you use this thing? Pretty much just like the square here, only it has an angle. So I'm going to lay it out. So you can see it's not quite long enough to reach the whole way. So I'm going to have to tinker with it a little bit, meaning I'm going to have to mark it, check it, mark it again, and make sure that I get everything lined up with that corner where I want it. Um, I can be just inside because those boxes I pointed out, my toolboxes before, they're actually a half inch shy of three feet. So it gives me a little bit of play on these ends because trying to saw right to a corner like that is really hard. So I want to saw just inside it. So I'll probably go a quarter inch in on both of these. So when I'm working, I want to push this right next to the board. And this again is the reference space we had before. And I'm going to line it up kind of by eye to start with because again, it's not quite long enough. I'm gonna draw my first line. I'm gonna take my square, and I'm just using it as a straight edge now. Actually, that's just about right. That's a little outside. So I'm gonna back up, because again, I want a little bit of meat on this far corner here, that way I'm not trying to saw into a very, very thin slip. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit, draw a second line. Line it up. And all this, again, takes some practice. This is not something you necessarily start out and go, hey, I'm amazing at this right off the bat. Believe me, I was not. Um, I spent a lot of time figuring out how all this stuff works. So then I've got that end done. Flop the board around. Make sure I line it up right so I do it the same way. And that is not it. That is the part that I get wrong most of the time as I line up my angles backwards. So again, it's not quite long enough, so I'm going to draw my first line. Check it with the square, or any kind of straight edge really will do at this point. That actually looks pretty close. I'm gonna flip it. And it's a little too far. So I'm gonna scoot back. I've got a little bit more meat right here on this corner than I really want because I really only want about a quarter inch. Okay, so I'm gonna line that out and that's about a quarter inch right there. Um, if you're really trying to be picky about it, obviously you would measure that and make sure you were right on. Again, this is gonna be a, a kick around box for camp. It'll be decorated, it'll be fancy, but I'm not gonna get too hung up on exactly on exact dimensions. When I cut the other um, side, basically I'm going to use this to measure it. I'm going to lay it out, I'm going to scribe the lines, and then I'm going to plane both sides together so they're exactly the same size. Um, I'm not going to get caught up on whether it's, you know, five, you know, half an inch or a quarter inch or whatever difference. I'm going to plane them to be exactly the same because I'm less concerned about the exact dimensions than I am in making sure that they fit together right. That's one of the joys for me of hand tools is I don't have to measure, I don't have to rely on the table saw to get everything exactly right. I clamp the two together, I plane them flush, and they're identical. They may not be exactly the size you originally set out for, but they are identical, so they're gonna make a nice box. So when it comes to sawing these, 
I'm going to go back and I'm going to use the um, the rip saw or the, not the rip saw the crosscut saw to take this off. When you first start, I would almost recommend going with a smaller saw, taking a little more time because this angle is important, and using a tool. And I may just demonstrate this. This this is a bench dog. You see, it's got a stop here. It's got a stop on the back. Basically, you put it up against your bench, and it doesn't go anywhere. That way, when you put a board on it, and you put, uh, I need another little board. Same board. Put a board under the back end, and I am not left-handed, so I can't actually cut this way. But you can take a saw and you can put it here, and you can cut very clean. When you're making, no, let's go back. So you can cut very cleanly this way. When you're making high-end furniture. You really do want to do it this way because then everything does have to match very closely. You'd take a knife, you'd cut the line, cut a little groove in for your saw to sit to start with. That way that edge has a super clean knife line rather than a slightly torn saw line. Um, and it gives it a very, a very re repeatable, clean cut. Um, again, we're making a more kick around box, so I'm just going to go straight back to the, uh, the saw bench and the crosscut saw. So we're back here, and basically, I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did for cutting it flat, only I'm going to follow this line at an angle here. I'm going to make sure I'm just off the edge of my bench, put my knee on it. I'm going to pinch right at the line. And actually, I'm going to bring the camera over again so you can see that little tiny cut I just made. See how it's right there on the outside of the line? So that little cut is where everything starts. And I want it just outside that line. That way, if anything goes wrong, I'm not cutting deep into where I want my box to be. And as you can see, I'm just going to take it nice and easy again. You'll notice slow down as I get to the end. I've got a quick question regarding staying on the line. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's just, you know, practice and muscle memory of how to stay on your line, whether it's a straight cross or a slightly angled cross. That is correct. It just takes practice and repetition. Um, again, it's a hand skill and any kind of hand skill, whether it's woodworking, leatherworking, textiles, they'll rely on that repetition and that gaining of muscle memory so that you know exactly what you're going to do. Um, when you first start, like when I first started, I would not have cut this that way. Um, it would have been all over the place. I would have knifed the line, I would have been much slower at it, and I would have been much more cautious about my cut because I just didn't have the skill level built up yet. That's the one place, well, one of two places where power tools really excel over hand tools. Power tools are very repeatable. Once you set your table saw up, it's gonna cut the same line as long as you put the board in the same every time. Once you get your fence set, you can just zip through things. When you are doing things by hand, you have to really develop the skill before you can do that. So when you first start, build some knock together furniture, build a six board chest like this, build something that's easy and forgiving. That way when you botch a line here and there, it's not that big a deal. Um, I can go back and look at some of my old furniture that I built, you know, 10 years ago, and it's definitely got some questionable bits and pieces here and there, but it's held together for 10 years, so that's okay. Uh, don't worry about it that much. It takes time to build up those skills. That, to me, is one of the great joys also of hand tool woodworking because I love acquiring that skill. I love knowing what it takes to get good at that sort of thing. Um, the other place that power tools really excel is in making your stock into more manageable sizes. So rip sawing big thick boards, uh, band saws, power planers, they have uh, even, even table saws, which quite frankly scare the living daylights out of me. 
Um, all those have a place in, in the shop for sizing your stock down to where it's manageable. Uh, even my shop here, although I don't have one yet, a bandsaw is on my list of things to get probably in the next four years because rip sawing big thick planks by hand is really getting old. I can do it, I'm good at it, it takes a lot of energy uh, and it's just not fun. So, or at least not fun anymore. When I first started, it was entertaining enough that I wanted to get good at it. Um, now that I've gotten decent at it, yeah, it's, it's not a whole lot of fun. Um, so that being said, I like the hand tools for all the finish work. For me, they make things a lot easier to put together. They're more forgiving. Um, you can do things with them that you can't do with a power tool. Uh, power tools make things faster. Pick the things that you wanna turn out fast. Use your power tools on that is my suggestion. But even if you're a, a hand tool or a power tool centric woodworking, there are a few hand tools like I pointed out earlier. That little block plane, that thing's indispensable pretty much for anybody as far as I'm concerned. I'm just gonna cut the other corner off this chest. Now I've got an angle on both sides. That's my chest angle. And when you first start, it's not gonna go quite that easy for you. It's gonna take some practice and that's okay. Work at it, try it play around with it and if you're power tool centric it's okay throw it on your table saw cut an angle you're done move on so now that we've got our angles cut on this thing we do need to plane it it's still got a little bit of a rock so my bench top is fairly flat so if the board has any twist or warp to it you'll see it when the board moves if it's flat it'll just sit there and it won't rock when i press it on. And again, we've got a little bit of a cut to things here. So what we need to do is flip over to this side, get rid of all this stuff. The edges are going to get beveled anyway, so it's not super critical to keep them super clean. We're going to take a plane and we're going to plane either edge. So I'm going to start out with a fairly rough set plane. This is a Stanley five and a quarter. Uh, most, I got lucky I got given this one. Most people will use like a Stanley five setup for this. Nice flat blade, sharp enough to shave. These things are lovely. And you can, you can see a difference between um, old and new. The gentleman this originally belonged to put his social security number on it. <laughs> now, he has long passed away, so it's not a big deal, but obviously we don't do that anymore. This is a bench stop. There's literally a hole in my bench. And this thing comes up and goes down. And what it's for is shoving a board up against so that you can plane it. So this is my stop. So I've got my plane, I've got my board against the stop. And I'm basically going to plane this side. And this does take a little bit of muck. So it's not something you can go in and expect it to just whiz through it it's like nobody's business. You do have to put a little bit of force into it. However, if your blade is good and sharp, you don't have to put a lot of force into it. And I'm pressing I have a question. Yes. So, I mean, you know, you mentioned if your blade is good and sharp, it shouldn't be too crazy difficult. How do you sharpen a plane? So, Michelle, let me pull one of the others. Parts of a plane. So this is your lever cap. This tightens everything in place. Plane body. This is called a frog. Don't ask me why. I really don't know. Um, handle, plane body, lateral adjuster, knob. This is your plane blade. This is called a chip breaker. It goes on top of the blade to kind of steady the blade and prevent chips from jamming. And you can use a regular screwdriver, but my wife was nice enough to get me a Lee Valley uh, plain knob for doing just exactly this. So the blade is flat all the way across in this case, and it's flat on the back. So basically you're, you're sharpening one bevel. When I first start and I want to sharpen up a plain blade, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a jig. This is based on an Eclipse model. They're about 15, 20 bucks. You can pick them up at my Ace Hardware here or on Amazon or a number of other places. When you first start sharpening, 
these things are the best in the world. So they make it repeatable, they make it easy. Basically they adjust out. You put your plane blade in. This one's already sharp, so I'm not really gonna do any sharpening on it. You set it down on a flat surface of some sort. It doesn't have to be granite, it can be a tile, it can be just about anything that's flat, a board even. You check the angle and make sure they match up. Basically I look down the side profile this way, make sure that it's touching. And then I'm gonna pretend this is my sharpening medium here. Basically I'll take and I'll put something like this on it, oil, hold it down and work it back and forth like this until I feel a burr all the way across the back edge. And then I'll turn it over and I'll flatten the back edge. Once that's done, I'll go to the next grit down and I'll do the same thing. And then the next grit down and do the same thing until it's polished and sharp. And let's see if this one's still sharp enough until I can shave with it. This one actually could use a touch up. So this is not an oil stone, this is a water stone. Um, and this again is for toning. We're just touching up that fine edge. And by the time I get here, I don't recommend most people start with freehand sharpening, but I've been doing this long enough now that it's not a big deal. Um, go with the honing guide to start with. Hone it good. Get everything nice and sharp. Test it out. And now I can take the hair off the back of my hand, although this one's still not as sharp as it probably should be. It does work. So last thing, I have a leather strop with some uh, steel polishing compound. Anybody doing metal work knows what this stuff is. Comes in a gray tube or a green stick or whatever. And basically it's just used to polish the edge of the blade. And I polish the back, it's a little hard freehand. I polish the back and I polish the front. All the way down, back and forth a few times. I lighten the pressure as we get closer to being done. And this basically just tunes up that very fine edge at the end. And make sure it cuts really nice and easy. Oh, that's better. Take the hair right off now. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, I use Dico apparently. I don't know if you can see that or not. It's gray, comes in a little tube. There's not much to it. And basically, when it comes to using it, you just take the strop, scrub it hard on there until you get a little bit of a gray layer, and then you're done. So back to this board real quick. So good sharp blade. And you can hear it as it cuts and takes a full shaving versus there's some scallops from the original planer. They're pretty ugly right here. This will probably be the inside of the box. Listen to it as it goes across that and you'll hear it kind of skip a beat. And that's how you know there's a hollow that you're not cutting into. And you can see and feel it. But you can just hear the difference. So I'll take a little bit of off this side. I'll flip it because the grain tends to run one direction and I don't want to cut up into it. Because if you go cross, if you go against the grain, you'll peel out big chunks, even with a nice sharp iron. All right, so now I've taken off some of the high edges. I'm going to check it for flat again. Still, these edges here are, are high. We're a little high in the middle. And basically, I will just go back and forth on this board until it starts to rest relatively flat. And a lot of this is just experience and practice and going back and forth. Already better, still not great, but better. So I'll plane the board down and as as you can see, this is already a whole lot smoother than this is. With a good sharp hand plane, you don't really need sandpaper. I haven't used sandpaper on any of my boxes in I don't know how long. The blade polishes it up super smooth and super nice. Um, at the moment, we're going to switch out and show off a little bit of carving for those interested in that. So I'm over here and pulling the side off the box that I showed earlier. 
And you'll see it's got the nails in it. Basically, I'm just going to press down. It's got all the nails and holes in it because I was doing what they call a dry fit, making sure everything fit up nice before I bothered carving it. Because um, you don't want to carve into an area that's going to cause you problems. Although historically, they didn't seem to care as much. Um, I'm going to grab a mallet, I'm going to grab a couple of boards, and then I'm going to grab out the carving tools. And just like the plane blades, the carving tools need to be razor sharp. If they are not, it makes carving a whole lot harder. This is one of the places where a lot of people wince. These are my holding boards, battens. You see how they have a nail in them? I drive them right into the bench and don't worry about it. Some people like to make benches that are fine furniture, and if that is your jam, you go for it. Mine is a tool meant to be used, so I use it. Normally, I don't lay these out on my carving piece, obviously, but just so you can see, this is my tool. Um, most of my gouges are from Hirsch. They're new. They're a little on the expensive side, but not vastly so, and they are really nice gouges. I've got a few older ones that I've tuned up over the years and a couple from Two Cherries and other places. Um, pretty much any modern maker of gouges makes good gouges. These are almost useless. Um, you use them very sparingly. These big flat ones that almost look like a chisel, but not quite, I use these more than any other. I use the large wide ones and I use not that one, which I use that a fair amount, but I use little tiny flat ones like, where's the other one? There it is, like these. These are probably three of the four or five gouges that I use the most. I have a and question. Are, yes, ma'am. Um, so, you know, you said that the little tiny curved ones are basically useless. What would the, be the circumstances you might use them? So if you do a lot of floral designs um, based, you know, 16, 17, 1800s, you, you can use them for flower petals and a few other things. Um, I thought I was going to use them for a lot more things because they are curved and because that's theoretically hard to get. But they just, I don't use them anywhere near as much as I would like. Um, either on the floral stuff or even on like Viking Age stuff. You, you can get almost the same effect with the little one here just by working it around and you can change the diameter. This one's a fixed diameter. It only does that one shape. This one's small enough that you can use it to create the same effect as, sorry, as this one. So again, I bought them thinking they would find much more use in my arsenal than they have. Um, so I recommend when people start, you get probably three or four gouges. Don't spend a lot of money on more than that until you figure out exactly what you're going to be carving and what you like to do. Um, get yourself, uh, gouges are numbered by the way. Um, they have a number for the curve or called the sweep and then they have a, a millimeter number these days. Like this one, I'm hoping you can see it, it's a number three sweep, so it's fairly shallow and it's 25 millimeters. So I like number threes and number fives for sweep. The most sweep I use on a common basis is a number seven, and even this one doesn't get a whole lot of use. Uh, mostly if I'm doing pinwheels, then I'll use the number seven. Um, so by yourself, a six millimeter number three, a three millimeter number three, a 20, uh, probably a 20 millimeter or a 20 millimeter number three, and a 20 millimeter number five. And those will get you through most of the things you are going to do. If you wanted one more to kind of round out the collection, there it is, a number five and 12 millimeter, because it's got enough curve and it's small enough, you can still do some really interesting things with it. Uh, the only other tool that I really recommend most people get is a good V gouge for doing line work. Hopefully you can see these. I've got the Hirsch one here, I've got an old one here, and I've got a two cherries in there as well. So I'm gonna set these out, I'm gonna move my tools out of the way. I do most of my carving sitting. So other people do it differently. It's up to you what you're comfortable with. So basically I'm gonna take the V tool for line work. Let's see, you can kind of see back there. And I've got a mallet, you can use a wooden one, a, a headed one. This one I like because I can hold it here or here. And when I'm doing this, I'm basically just following the lines that I drew on. 
And what I'm trying to do is get the design set in so that it doesn't get smudged, so that I know where my chisels go, so that I can basically follow it up with the chisels. I'm just going to do a small part here so you can kind of see how the process works. Um, for those who are really interested in carving, the guy who got me inspired is a gentleman named Peter Follinsby. He's written a number of books. He used to be the joiner at Plymouth Plantation. His blog, if you look up Peter Follinsby, shows 18th century carving from early America. And he takes photos of the backs and the bottoms and shows you how things are put together. And it's really fantastic. Um, He's been doing a set of video blogs lately, or videos on YouTube, showing how he turns and does other things. So we're going to skip ahead. Normally, I will go through with the V tool like that and line out everything. But for the moment, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Actually, I'm going to do two more quick sections. That way, I can cut this middle bit out and then see how I go about doing that. And that's going to go across. The Your Grace, is that mallet a common tool or is that something that you found this is, specific? This is a carver's mallet. Um, it's specifically made for this kind of kind of work. Um, I found I like that because it's got a heavy weight at the end, so it makes carving easier. You don't have to hit things hard. I used to use my wooden mallets. They work fine. Um, they take a little bit more force. And depending on what I'm doing, I'll still go back to the wooden mallet for certain things. It is so cool. I love tools. That thing is amazing. Yeah, this, this is a mallet I made. I mean, you can see it's been beat up. This is like my favorite wooden mallet ever. Um, does but it does, have a name? It does not. I don't tend to name my tool. Um, probably should, considering I've used them for like 12 years. One of the keys when it comes to carving, if you want to get relatively quick at it, is make sure your tools are all laid out where you know where they're at. When I first start a project, it's always a little bit helpful skelter until I get my feel for where I'm going to put everything. And then I try and put it in the same spot every time. And right now I'm a little cramped for space because we're down on this end. So basically, those lines that I just used the V tool on, I'm going through with the chisel and I'm kind of setting it straight up and down, driving it in relatively hard as you can see. And now I'm going to go through. This is where the, uh, the number seven comes in handy with the big sweep. This is what I use to pop out big chips. It just cleared the majority of that waste about that fast. And now I'm going to use the smaller um, number five or 12 millimeter number five, and it's going to chase around the edges. And I'm I've got a grip, and I'm using it to steer the chisel as I mount. I'm not pushing with my grip because that leads to gouging things out. I'm using the mallet to do all of the actual hammering and force. My hand is just there to guide it along. And this is the rough stage. This is where things, this is the ugly, ugly baby stage, as my wife calls it when she's doing illumination. So the chips look ugly. There's nothing really pretty about this set. But again, I'm pressed for time at this moment. So I'm going to press on. Where's my, there's it is. So I'm going to go to the little one. Now, I'm not using the mallet. Now I'm going to use a two-handed grip like this. The one finger there to guide it and this hand to hold it so I don't slip. So I pressed my arm on the thing here. I'm basically going to go across and I'm using this hand to stop the chisel from going free. That way I can push it and clean it up. And this again, like all hand work, is just a technique you have to play with and get a feel for. What you can get away with. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to break pieces out. When it comes to the little nose areas, I break those all the time. This is your friend. Ace Hardware carries it. Now and again, Home Depot will. This is a traditional uh, hide glue that Type Bond still makes. If you look at a lot of my stuff in the little areas, they're broken. I've glued them back together. It's okay. Once you get some linseed oil on it and it's glued in place, they don't come apart again, so it doesn't matter. But it's just to reassure that it, you that if it breaks, it is not the end of the world. So you have to be careful of following the grain when you're carving. So my grain is running this way. So if I cut up into the grain, I will chip this whole section out here. It's a little hard to see on video, I'm sure. So basically, I'll have to go in when I round it and carve backwards. Normally, I have two hands on this, but you can't see through one hand with the camera. 
and you'll peel up little chips and you'll round it out. Since the grain is running this way, this one I want to carve up that way, which is easier to see. So basically I'll come in and I'll start smoothing it out. And I, normally I do, the, I do all of one stage before I move on to the next. But again, a little pressed for time. So I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. I'm trimming up the edge because my last chisel made it a little janky. And I will literally just go through and I'll sit here for hours at a crack because I find this really meditative. And just slowly work down all the little spots until they're as deep as I want, until things are as rounded out as I want. I'm gonna move the camera over so you can see what I've just done. So that's the spot that I just carved out. It's not entirely smooth. It's got a ridge right there that, that I will take down eventually. You can see where I've lined it out. I'm gonna take you back over to the box so you can see how this all ends up. That's what we're looking at right there. You can see it's got some depth. I'm gonna pan up. Can you guys see right there? See how it's a little yellowed, a little weird looking? Remember how I said I break things? Yeah, that's glue. It's all right, we'll get painted, nobody will notice. But it's fairly deep, it's fairly rounded. You can see all the inner connects and interlaces are done. And it's just a matter of taking your time and learning the feel of the wood. You don't get all of it automatically. It's like sawing. Things that should be ridiculously easy seeming really turn out to take a little bit of practice and work. And it's okay. Keep your tools sharp, keep things tuned up. Like when I'm carving here, the other thing that I keep down near my bench is that strop you saw. So basically I'm using the rounded edge of the strop to strop the inside of the curve of the chisel. And then the outside curve, basically just work it back and forth with a, a little bit of a rolling motion like that. And that tunes up the edge. And I'll keep my strop right by my bench and I will strop the gouges as I go. As they get just ever so slightly dull, I will tune them up on the go. You don't need to take them back to the, the stone all the time. You do periodically, especially if you're working a lot of harder wood, but pine, pine just needs you to touch them up all the time because it's, it's soft and it's finicky. If, you, if you're really interested in carving, pine is cheap, but poplar is easier to carve, and alder, if you get some nice clean alder, carves amazingly well. Uh, but if, if budget is an issue or if you have plenty of pine laying around, carve away. Avoid stuff with lots of knots like we talked about at the beginning. Get nice clean grain. Um, it carves easy. You can see how fast I whacked out that one section. Um, if you're interested in doing later period carving, some of the later period floral and rosette stuff is even easier to do. Um, again, it just takes some practice and some layout. Um, as you can see, I draw everything on before I get to whacking at it with a chisel and mallet. That way I can follow my lines. Uh, people who are a little more uh, drawing artistic will have a little easier time with that. It takes me quite a while to draw something like that on and I have to erase pieces and try again. And if it's really bad, I plane it off. That's my eraser. I'm happy to answer questions. And if anybody has any, now's a good time. When you're searching for vintage or antique tools, is there any sort of, um, I guess, testing that you do or way that you look at them to recognize quality? So it depends on what I'm looking for. Hand planes and saws, like, like a hand plane, make sure the adjusting knob adjusts, take the blade apart, make sure everything looks okay, make sure nothing's chipped or broken on it. But basically, if it all functions, if it's a Stanley, you're pretty much in good shape. Some of the other makers can get a little dodgy. Um, they, they got worse as the years gone on. But pretty much anything from the early 1900s to about 1955, 1960 worked really well. Um, Chisels are really tricky. A lot of people have mistreated them, badly used them. Um, really, these days, go out and just buy a decent set of chisels. You'll have to sharpen them anyway, but they work nice. Um, I have a set of blue-handled Irwin marples that I got early on. They're workhorses. There's nothing wrong with them. I have vintage chisels. I really like my vintage chisels, but honestly, they're not really any better than the marples. Um, that's, that's what it comes down to. Gouges. I have some vintage ones. The vintage ones are really nice once you get them sharpened up. But again, they're not really any better than the Hirsch or the, the Fie Full File. I don't know how to pronounce them. They're Swiss made. Woodcraft carries. They're really nice gouges. They're a little expensive, like the Hirsch. They're 20 to 30 bucks a gouge. So you're not looking at something cheap here. And don't with gouges, don't go cheap. 
get a limited toolkit of good ones, it will serve you a lot better than a big toolkit of cheap ones. Cheap ones make carving such a pain in the rear because they just don't hold an edge. They're painful to use. I, I do not recommend starting with cheap gouges. You can do other things cheap. Gouges aren't one of them, at least not in my experience. Um, when I'm looking for saws, I want to make sure that the saw is nice and straight, that it's not kinked or wonky. Um, the teeth, you'll probably have to sharpen anyway. A little bit of rust isn't a big deal. You can clean that up. But if the saw plate isn't straight, if it's kinked in the middle, like that, or even wavy, don't. It's, it's, you can fix them, but it's a pain and they're never quite the same. Um, I've tried. But really, a lot of it's just shopping around and playing with them and fixing them and learning what you like. If you like vintage stuff like I do, it, I, I have way more of it than I really need by any stretch because I, I like buying a lot of it, I like restoring it, I like using it. If you have a little bit of money and you just wanna get good tools to start with, Lee Valley makes a really good set of tools and Lee Nielsen makes probably some of the best hand tools mass, mass produced. Um, you can't call their factory really mass produced because there's only so much market for it. Okay, thank you very much. This was wonderful. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad everybody enjoyed stuff.